Though William Wallace had won an impressive victory at Stirling Bridge, and the English were now mostly driven out of Scotland, the war was certainly not over, and the Scottish leaders knew they would soon have to contend with an even greater invasion by Edward himself. In the aftermath of the Battle of Stirling in 1297, there was a degree of continued fighting between English and Scottish forces. The English made some limited attempts to reassert their control, as John de Warren managed to break the Scottish sieges of Roxburgh and Berwick, but this did not amount to anything significant. It wasn't until Edward returned from Flanders that another major campaign could be launched. The English monarch grudgingly made peace with the French king to avoid a protracted two-fronted conflict, and set out to deal with Scotland personally. He began assembling a large army composed of mounted knights, foot soldiers, and archers, the latter of which were primarily of Welsh origin, and the force even included some Gascons from southwestern France. Compared to the army which had been defeated by the Scots at Stirling Bridge, this was a massive host with a corps of a few thousand mounted knights, and perhaps as many as 20,000 infantry, although, as with most medieval armies, exact numbers are difficult to determine. Edward marched north and entered Scotland, supported by a significant fleet to keep his army resupplied. Though the Scottish did not challenge the invaders directly, they did devastate the countryside through which the English would march, and stripped it of supplies. To this destruction, was added plenty of looting and pillaging by the advancing English army. Despite their significant supply problems, Edward's men succeeded in occupying much of the southern regions of Scotland, including Edinburgh itself. Still, fighting enough to eat was a serious issue, and there were divisions in Edward's army, which at times erupted into outright violence. This is evident by one instance in which a number of Welsh became involved in a brawl with a group of Englishmen leaving some of the Welsh dead and many of the others unwilling to continue. Indeed, when some of the Welsh even threatened to defect to the Scots, Edward confidently retorted, Then we shall defeat the whole lot of them in one go. Wallace's plan had likely been to wear the English down with scorched earth tactics and then harass them as they were forced to withdraw after running out of supplies perhaps even falling on the rearguard and harrying Edward out of the country. However, he misjudged his enemy. Despite the many difficulties he and his army had faced, Edward did not retreat, and when he learned of his enemy's location, instead set out to confront Wallace where his army was positioned near Falkirk. Caught flat-footed by the suddenness of the English advance, the outnumbered Scottish were unable to retreat, and their army had no choice but to give battle at their current location. The two armies clashed at a hill near Falkirk, Edward's force having perhaps twice as many men as Wallace did, though perhaps not as formidable as at Stirling, as they had little time to prepare. The Scottish under Wallace did have a strong defensive position on top of a hill, with boggy terrain and a stream in front of them, and a forested area to the rear. The Scottish infantry formed into four schultrons, a kind of circular phalanx of spearmen, with archers interspersed between them and the small number of cavalry to the rear. As the English army came into view, Wallace sought to steal the nerves of his men, claiming, I have brought you to the revel, now dance if you can. There was nothing left to do but wait for the inevitable attack and hope for the best. The battle opened with the vanguard of English heavy cavalry advancing in the Scottish position. They were forced to skirt around the sides of the bog, which somewhat slowed them down, but were then able to charge against Scottish ranks in full force. On the right, faced with this assault, the Scottish horsemen buckled and fled very quickly from their superior English opposites, and would play no further part in the struggle. Indeed, the speed at which they had retreated even caused some to later accuse them of treason, though it seems likely that they really did just flee in the face of overwhelming force. Continuing the attack, Edward's cavalry then rode over the unprotected Scottish archers and easily routed them. The English knights now turned against the Scottish infantry, but despite defeating the opposing cavalry and bowmen with relative ease, were unable to break through the dense formations of spearmen opposing them, and had to withdraw. They had failed to win the battle alone, 
but succeeded in denuding the Scottish infantry of most of their supporting units. The English infantry had by this time moved forward, and their longbowmen walked into range. Without any fear of return fire, the archers began subjecting the inert Scottish infantry to a devastating barrage of arrows. The Scots had no option but to stand in position as gaping holes were created in their lines, and the men fell in droves. With the Scottish ranks bloodied and disordered, the English knights charged again and broke through the gaps. Their defensive formations now shattered, there was little the Scottish spearmen could do to resist this attack. The Scottish army collapsed, and the English butchered them as they fled, though a number, including Wallace himself, were able to escape into the woods. Even after having won the battle, Edward couldn't reconquer all of Scotland immediately, and bitter resistance would drag on. A two-pronged attack led by both King Edward and his son, Edward II, failed to bring the issue to a conclusion. But in 1303, another invasion was launched, complete with a significant number of siege engines. This offensive pushed through the country and went about reducing strongholds one by one, including the mighty castle at Stirling, which was captured with the help of Edward's great trebuchet, Warwolf. By 1304, leading Scottish nobles submitted, and the country had been subjugated yet again. As for Wallace, after his defeat, he faded from the light of history, resigning from the position as Guardian of Scotland, though he appears to have taken part in a diplomatic mission to France, and continued to participate in raids and small-scale attacks on the English. However, in 1305, he was captured, taken to London, tried, and sentenced. He was then executed, in perhaps one of the most grisly methods available, by being hanged, drawn, and quartered. His head was then displayed in London, and other severed body parts sent to cities in Scotland. Despite Wallace's death and Edward's success, complete control over Scotland would continue to elude the English monarch, and the struggle was far from over, as a new figure would soon emerge to champion this cause of Scottish independence.